Hello everyone and welcome back to Horrifica, the channel for all your horror needs. I'm coming at you with the second installment of my three-part review of the Fear Street movies that are hitting Netflix this month. And this second one does not disappoint, so let's get started. First off, my spoiler-free thoughts. The movie is a great watch with equal parts gore and lore. This whole movie is a flashback to 1978 and what happened the night of the Camp Nightwing Massacre. So we sort of have an idea of who lives and who dies already, but the movie does throw you for a loop a few times, which is exciting. If you want a solid summer camp slasher with a rich and inventive lore behind it, then this is definitely worth your watch. Just make sure that you've watched part one first to fully understand what's happening. All right, now I'm getting into spoiler territory and onto my in-depth Thoughts. So, major spoilers up ahead, obviously. If you haven't watched the movie, pause this video, go watch it, and then come back. Alright, here we go. We come back to Dina and Josh with a possessed Sam out to find help. The opening scene for this movie is very interesting. We actually get to see how the former survivor of Sarah Fear's attacks from the Nightwing Massacre is living her life. I find the use of the alarm clocks to get her through her day, an interesting take on depression. That's what I think it is, a mixture of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And she also has these calendars marked with the counting of days since the Camp Nightwing incident. Like, she can't forget about it. She has to keep remembering it. She's forcing herself to remember almost. It's very intense. By the way, if any of you guys out there struggle with these issues, this movie might not be for you because it does touch upon these topics in very subtle ways, but it might trigger you. Now, first off, I want to point out the connection I made in my first review video. If you haven't watched it, the link will be in the description below. Uh, the mysterious note that that sus cop guy slid through mail slot toward the end of the movie, uh, it did end up with the girl who survived the Camp Nightwing attacks. Uh, I was right in assuming that, and we're also going to find out just how the sheriff knows about the witch in this movie. We follow this girl, this woman, through her routine with her good boy dog, who thankfully doesn't die, by the way. So, dogs do not die in this movie. <laughs> As she locks her windows and doors, but she doesn't lock one good enough, we see when a mysterious figure unlatches it and slithers in. But C. Berman, as she's referred to at this point in the film, is quick to act in defending herself. Good for her that this mysterious guest is only Dina and her brother Josh looking for help. After some convincing from the kids, C. Berman sits them down for a little story time. Now we go way, way back to the summer of July 1978 with Camp Nightwing. Can I just say before we keep going, I'm a huge fan of the mu music in this movie as well. Maybe even more so than the music from 1994's movie. Uh, it's got a kick-ass soundtrack of songs from the time period. And they really fit with the vibes of the film. And, and then once again, they're perfectly put in there to enhance the viewing. So. Ziggy Berman is one is running through the woods being chased by some bitchy mean girl campers. They're chasing her and calling her a witch. And we find out very soon that they are near the same tree where the witch Sarah Fear was hung all those years ago. Uh, Ziggy gets a bloody nose, but to be fair, it's not fr it's from getting elbowed in the face. So I, s I still stand by my bloody nose theory at this point, though. And it turns out to be true, but more on that later. After an altercation with the other kids, Ziggy goes to see the kindly nurse, Miss Lane. We find out now that one of the killers, the girl with the razor blade, was actually Nurse Lane's daughter. So you remember the girl who was singing that old-timey song in the first movie? I believe her name is Ruby Lane. She's this nurse's daughter, and uh, it seems like the nurse, she still can't let it go. She's so confused about the fact that her sweet, kindly daughter could do something like that. I honestly like this connection that we have, and it brings a solid foundation for the film and the reason why the events take place. I really like how they're putting in 
all of these solid connections and feeding us this lore in an interesting way that kind of still makes us keep guessing all the way through. They're not spoon feeding it to us. They're doing it in a way that makes us want to figure out more, which is pretty great. So Ziggy tries to tell her older sister, Cindy Berman, uh, who's a camp counselor. So Ziggy's in her last year of camp and Sydney's her first year of counseling. And Cindy is her first year of counseling there. So the nurse, uh, she tries to tell her sister that the nurse seems to be acting weird after she had a strange encounter with her while Nurse Lane was helping her with her wound that she got from that bitchy girl, Sheila. So Sheila's this really bitchy, sunny veiler girl. And obviously Ziggy and her sister are from Shadyside. Cindy brushes it off until later when her and her boyfriend, calm, nice, and caring Tommy, are cleaning up the mess hall, and Miss Lane just attacks Tommy out of nowhere, claiming that one way or another he will be dead by the end of the night anyways. The cops are called, and Miss Lane is taken away as the teens ponder over what's happened. Cindy takes what Ziggy said to heart and goes to search the nurse's office with Tommy to see if they can find out if Miss Lane was on some sort of drug and that made her go crazy and attack Tommy. So at this point, they're just blaming it all on drugs. Instead, they find a journal, one where Miss Lane had written down a bunch of stuff about the legend of the witch. So all the lore and the poems and the information on Sarah Cindy and Tommy, along with their friend Stoner's Alice and her boyfriend Arnie, find out that the campsite is the same site as the original settlement of the town before it was divided into Shadyside and Sunnyvale. So the grounds that they're on are the original settlement where Sarah Fear lived before she was hung. Alice and Arnie want to investigate the markings on the journal. There's a map in the journal with some X marks on it. So they take off into the woods and a reluctant Cindy and Tommy follow as the rest of the camp around them gets ready for the color wars. Look, guys, color wars really got me caught off guard with its racial and societal undertones. I need to take a moment and break this apart for you. Just like in the first film, this one is trying to make a strong statement about how life in Shadyside is worse and that all the people there are destined to be deadbeats or murderers and that there's no way out. Whereas Sunnyvale is nice and posh and full of wealthy people. The Sunnyvale people treat the shady siders like trash. And don't think I didn't notice that fact, that a majority of the shady siders were kids of color, but all of the Sunnyvalers were Caucasian kids. That, that's something that I definitely picked apart. Once again, this series of films is poking at the way people treat each other and the biases that they have toward each other. Uh, Not to mention the fact that the killer only seems to be going after the shady side campers and counselors, while leaving the sunny veilers alone. If that's not a statement about society, then I really don't know what is, guys. So back back to the movie after that little breakdown. Our four teens end up finding some holes dug in the ground, and they also find a house, which seems to have been recently visited by someone, as Alice points out. They also have this um, thought that this is probably Sarah Fear's house by the stuff that's inside of it. Tommy is really starting to act sus AF as they explore this strange place. He ends up sitting motionless on the ground as the others discover a strange room with weird, seemingly satanic carvings on the ground. So, Tommy's acting crazy, guys. Like, he's not responding to people. He has this despondent look on his face, and he has these bugs flying around him as if they think he's dead, which is interesting. So as they're looking at the satanic carvings in this room, Arnie goes back to talk to Tommy while Alice and Cindy continue to look around the space. Cindy finds another opening in the wall, and Alice finds some carvings of names on the wall. Alice shows Cindy that Tommy's name, Thomas Slater, is on the wall full of serial killers from the town's past, including Miss Lane's daughter's name. So after a little bit of bickering and Cindy saying, this is some kind of joke, right? And she's like, well, I don't have anything to carve into this wall, your boyfriend's name. So 
after thinking about this for a second, they surmise that this must have been the reason for Miss Lane attacking Tommy in the mess hall. Because she was the one who had been in the room and seen his name on the wall. Knowing that these are the killers of the past, she must have assumed that Tommy was was the next killer and wanted to put an end to it before he could go on a spree. So that's an interesting thought. If you knew who the next killer was going to be, if you killed them before they started their killing spree, would they not be able to come back? Would they not be able to kill? Would Seraphir not have any power over them? That's interesting. That's a thought I want to lock away, and maybe they're going to explain it a little bit more in the third movie, because they don't really explain it here. So, she was right, of course. Uh, the, the girls were right to assume this. Um, Miss Lane was correct. Um, because as the kids go into the next room, we see Tommy snap, pick up an axe, and plunge it into Arnie's face. Yes, guys, the kills are much more graphic in this one, and there are more kills. As any good slasher knows, you need more kills in your second flick. Now, we get our obligatory chase scene. Alice and Cindy get away for now, but Tommy is out for blood. Hacking and slashing campers. Interestingly enough, as I pointed out before, he only seems to kill shady siders. Yeah, don't think I didn't notice that, and I'm sure there's a reason for it. And he has an ample opportunity to go for the Sunnyvaler kids. They're right there, but he ignores them. Nick, the nice counselor who seems to have a thing for Ziggy, and Ziggy end up going out and trying to find the rest of the campers, and Ziggy to save Sheila, who was still locked in the outhouse after a prank. So the bitchy mean girl. Um, Nick and Ziggy played a prank on her earlier in the movie. And instead of after fighting off Sheila, she actually finds her sister and Alice trapped underground under the outhouse. So those two girls were actually going through this underground tunnel system. That's how they got away from Tommy because it collapsed. And they had to find their way out. It was a whole maze situation. So, Ziggy and another counselor, I totally forgot his name, but he dies anyway, so it's fine. I just try to get them out, but Tommy is out for blood, and he kills that guy that's helping Ziggy, and Ziggy's gotta run. And once again, Tommy ignores the totally prone, totally killable Sunny Valor, Sheila, who's unconscious. I think that this curse and the killers only go after shady side people, and the characters have hinted at this being a possibility for a while now, so I'm going to assume that I'm correct in thinking this at this point. Also, at this time, I want to give the movie props for some of the kills. We even get a decapitation, uh, though it would have been more fun if it wasn't so CG. Uh, the blood is kind of CG. I It would have been better if it was all just special effects. But I mean, this is a more modern movie, so what do you expect? I can't complain, though, because the kills are pretty solid. It, it's very, it's it's pretty nice. Uh, so Tommy chases after Ziggy, who finds Nick again, and the other campers have escaped on the bus already. Nick and Ziggy try to avoid Tommy. Nick gets hit by Tommy and tells Ziggy to run. So that's the last we see of Nick for a little while. And some people might assume that he is dead at this point, but we'll see. I'd like to remind you that Nick is a sunny veiler, not a shady cider. So at this point, Cindy and Alice have kind of figured out a way to get out of the underground. And uh, this next scene is really cool. I I like the creativity that went into this game of cat and mouse between Tommy and Ziggy. She plays some music over the PA system so he can't hear her. It's kind of mirroring the... It's the same music from earlier on in the film when they were getting ready for color war and someone had put a rock over the button for the PA and played some music from a a boombox of some sort. Uh, Like a cassette tape player, I guess, is what it was. And it's really interesting um, that they kind of uh, mirrored that and it was the same song and everything. So she did this to the PA system so he can't hear her walking around, which is really smart. And uh, she also leaves her bloody footprints on the ground, though I'm not sure if this was intentional on her part or not, (laughs) to lead him into the supply closet where she's ready with a knife. Now, unfortunately, the music does stop abruptly as she's sneaking up behind him and a fight breaks out between the two. I really love the mirroring in this scene in particular as well. 
with the struggle between Ziggy and Tommy. And at the same time, Cindy hearing this because she's underground in the same building that they're in. And she's at this grate trying to get out from the underground. And she's trying desperately to break out from the grate so she can help her sister. I love how they show Tommy getting the bag on his head as well at this scene uh, that his character was sporting in the first movie by Ziggy trying to suffocate him with it, and then it kind of molds to his face. So in this scene, what happens is um, Ziggy and Tommy are fighting, and then it flashes to Cindy trying to break out of the grate, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. I think they did something similar to this in the first movie, which I also thought was a nice scene. I just can't remember, though. So Cindy gets out. And she actually ends up killing Tommy. So Goody Two Shoes Cindy Berman ends up stabbing someone to death. Her own boyfriend. And <laughs> or so they think. I mean, because guys, we know that he's not going to stay dead. <laughs> so the three girls, yeah, remember, Alice is still there. Uh, they discuss what to do next when Ziggy gets a nosebleed. And it drips on the finger bone of the witch's hand that Alice has found in the ground earlier. She would brought it up with her. Uh, so Ziggy sees the witch just like Sam from the first film and now the girls having the information about the witch and knowing that she's angry uh, they decide that they want to put an end to the curse so they decide to bury the hand with the body to stop the curse because they think they know where the body is so at this time the witch is so mad that she sends her killers after them and we actually get to see some of the other killers in action, including the milkman and the kid with the baseball bat from the first film, those little flashes. So uh, to start off with, Alice gets hacked and slashed by a reanimated Tommy because, of course, he's not going to stay dead. Why would you leave the weapon with him, guys? Come on. Because you can't keep a good axe-wielding murderer down, guys. He didn't stay dead. Cindy actually does something really badass and... We get a second decapitation in this movie when she takes his head off with the shovel. She shoves it into his neck and just crushes it until the head pops off and falls on the ground. But that's not going to keep him down for long, guys. He's, he's still going to get back up. So now the girls are on the run. And at this point, we all know their efforts are futile and that only one of them survives. So they both end up dying trying to put the hand with the body after they realized that the killers were after Ziggy because she bled on the bones and saw the witch. So Cindy tries to sacrifice herself to save her sister and she ends up dying as well. So now both sisters are laying there dead. But guys, remember Nick? Yeah, Nick's still alive because he's a sunny bailer and of course Tommy just walked right away from him. And he's the one who ends up saving Ziggy by giving her CPR. At this point, Dina and Josh finally realize that they're talking to Christine Ziggy Berman and not Cindy Berman. So, wow movie, way to try and throw us for a loop with the whole C. Berman thing. They even had um, um, Christine Ziggy. Ziggy actually has red hair and um, they had it so C. Berman's hair was dyed brown like Cindy Berman's hair color. Uh, it was kind of a dead giveaway at the point where Ziggy was the one to bleed onto the bone and see the witch because we knew that that was the only person who survived. So Dina and Josh inform her that they know where the body is of the witch where she's buried and ask Ziggy where the, to find the hand, which is actually under that tree in the middle of the mall, right back to where the opening of the first movie took place. Um, in that scene where Heather gets stabbed to death by Skullface. So the movie ends with Dina putting the hand back with the body and a flashback to 1666 where it all started. And Dina is playing the lead role of Sarah Fear. And that's where they stop us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am in love with how rich in lore this movie is. It's not just a summer camp teen slasher. It runs really deep in terms of plot and context. I have to say that I enjoyed this movie quite a bit, but not as much as the first film because I felt more attached to the characters in that one since I didn't know their fates. Still, this series just keeps getting better and better, and I'm excited for the last film to air because I really want to see how it all began. 
So I realized in my last video that I didn't rate the first movie, so let me rate both of them. Now for the first movie, um, 1994, I give it a 7.5 out of 10. And this movie, 1978, I give it a 7 out of 10. So please let me know your thoughts and theories for the final film and your thoughts on this one in the comments below. And I will see you guys next time. Until then.